so shocking as to be almost unbelievable. A condo building collapsing in an instant, burying residents and taking potentially more than 100 lives. But is that building along the coast of Florida a fluke, an isolated incident, or could something so horrific happen here? Everyone feels a little anxious uh, because of what happened in Florida. These are things we need to urgently examine along our West Coast as well as another urgent issue plaguing L.A. County, homelessness and the mentally ill. As the population of mentally ill Angelenos grows, the ability to assist them is not keeping pace. But the Board of Supervisors is working to put a new plan in place. People have serious mental illness, they're kind of thrown away and they end up on the streets. We have to stop that. These, these are our brothers and our sisters. We have to do a better job. And here in L.A. County, we're seeing an astonishing experiment to heal an historic wrong. Bruce's Beach, along a pricey stretch of L.A.'s South Bay, was seized from a black family a century ago. And now it could be returned to their descendants. We'll talk all about this as Fox 11 News In Depth starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Hal Eisner. We've all been watching a horror story play out in Miami as the search continues for victims trapped when a condo building came crashing down. As days go by, we hear more about what might have caused that collapse. Stories of design flaws, structural cracking, and possible damage from sea and weather have emerged. That brought on concerns about other coastal properties in our own area. Now, you may have been wondering whether this could happen right here. Of course, we, we don't know, but we hope not. And so does L.A. County Supervisor Janice Hahn. Supervisor Hahn joining us, and thanks for being here. Good to see you. Thanks, Hal. It's good to be with you. So let, let's talk about that. Uh, what, what is your reaction, first of all, to what has happened in Miami and what we are doing here? I think what happened in Surfside, Florida, was a wake-up call for all of us, um, particularly county officials, um, to make sure that something like what happened there does not happen here. Uh, but you begin to look at other high-rise buildings that look similar to that condominium complex that collapsed in the middle of the night, and you really want to make sure um, that the residents living in those similar uh, buildings are indeed safe. Now, Marina Del Rey, that, that might be an area similar in a sense. And, and so there was a, an inspection of some very prominent buildings over there. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. Well, after what happened in Surfside, I began hearing from residents of the Marina City Club who, who were also concerned after they watched the images of that complex collapsing in Surfside because the place that they lived actually resembles um, that condominium complex. So they began to express their concerns about repairs and maintenance that they knew um, probably needed to get done sooner than later. Um, and as a result of their concerns, I asked all of our uh, public works officials and our County of Los Angeles building inspectors to go out there the very next day and do an initial assessment of that high rise. You know, go floor to floor, look in the garage, look in the parking garage, look at the pool deck and see if there's anything that sends up a red flag um, that denotes some possible imminent danger. I didn't think they would find anything, but I think the residents deserved to have an answer or, of whether or not you know, they were in danger. Thankfully, at the end of one full day of inspection, our inspectors did not uh, see anything that posed imminent danger uh, where they would have had to red tag the building and evacuate residents. But clearly um, there are some repairs and there is some maintenance that will need to be done um, as soon as possible to just you know, make sure that that building is safe and that nothing like what happened in Florida would happen here. But, but are these minor tweaks or are these major repairs you're talking about? I think any building of that age probably just needs to have, you know, some repairs done. Uh, we've seen, uh, you know, some cracks. We've seen some pipes that probably look like they need to be repaired. Um, there's some issues around the pool deck. Again, all these issues reminded the residents of, of what happened in Florida. Um, but we're going to have the building owner um, 
hire their own structural engineer and do a more thorough assessment of this particular high rise. And then we in the county will look at that report and together um, we'll decide what the what the next plan of action will be. Yeah, this my, my, has- my goal is to keep people safe, right? I want people to be safe and I want people to feel safe um, because there's, there's no use living in, in a place as beautiful um, and as expensive as that uh, location and not feel safe where you live. And, and as these sort of oversights go on, people are continuing to live in their condos? Yes, everybody um, is living there. Again, um, we were able to tell the residents at the end of the day that there were no major safety issues that that would have um, initiated an evacuation. Uh, But we are now going to make sure that the repairs that need to be done are done and that the building owner move forward um, and do the necessary, uh, just the the regular maintenance that needs to take place on a building like that. Are there any other buildings that that, uh, you think need to be looked at, other areas that are very similar? So I have asked our uh, Department of Public Works, I've asked our building inspectors to now begin to look at all high rises in unincorporated county. That's the only thing that I'm responsible for, not different cities in the county. Um, So we'll be looking at similar high rises throughout unincorporated county and do the same thing, right? Go in, bring all your building inspectors, go floor by floor, floor, unit by unit if they have to, look at the parking garages, look at the pool decks, um, look at uh, all the issues that might signify something more serious. Um, But to be honest with you, most of those high rise are in Marina Del Rey. So we'll be doing the same thing um, that we did last week for the Marina City Club with other high rises. And I think that's important for the residents. Everybody's watching the news every night. Everybody's watching what's happening in Florida. And it's unthinkable um, that that could happen to your loved ones um, or yourself. So we we're we're reacting to that for sure. But but and I have to wrap this segment. But but short answer, the people who live in those condos that that you may have some relative concern about, how do they feel safe? Should they feel safe? They should feel safe. Um, that was the goal of of having all the building inspectors descend on that high rise last week and make the initial assessment. They should feel safe, but they should also know um, that uh, the county will be paying attention and will be holding the building owner accountable uh, for any repairs or maintenance that needs to be done. Coming up on Fox 11 News In Depth, next up, desperation. People on the streets dealing with emotional and mental trauma. Where can they get help? We talk about that with Supervisor Hahn when we come back. Welcome back to Fox 11 News in Death. I'm Hal Eisner. The L.A. County Board of Supervisors voted recently to expand a program to send intervention teams to help the severely mentally ill on our streets. The teams include psychiatrists, mental health counselors, psychiatric nurses, psychiatric social workers, substance abuse counselors, medical case workers, and peers. But the psychiatric mobile response teams currently don't have the resources to handle the problems we have now. So what are the tools the Board of Supervisors has been looking at to help solve the problems of homelessness and the rampant mental illness and addiction issues that fuel it? LA County Supervisor Janice Hahn with this half hour. Last month, the L.A. County Board of Supervisors took some action with uh, you and and Supervisor Barger to to expand the psychiatric mobile response teams. This is also known as PMRT. And uh, what can you tell us about that? And and, and why was there a need to expand? I think anybody that has taken a, a hard look at The people who are living on our streets, our unhoused, our homeless population, know that a a large number of those living on our streets have mental health challenges. And that's been frustrating for a lot of people. I mean, people are living on our streets for all sorts of reasons, but a lot of them have mental health challenges. And we have not been able to have enough 
mental health resources to address this growing problem on our streets. This, these mobile um, response teams that are psychi these psychiatric mobile response teams are mental health professionals like you laid out. And they're able to respond to people having a mental health crisis or just an ongoing mental health challenges as they're living on our streets. Um, the problem has been there has not been enough of them and they only um, operated during the day. Uh, and they didn't operate seven days a week. And we know um, that many of us have witnessed people in our own neighborhoods, we can tell, need uh, mental health uh, professional uh, help. Um, and we didn't know who to call. And what we're trying to do is to um, provide responses to these people that are not law enforcement. Uh, we don't necessarily want sheriffs going out there um, with their guns drawn, um, responding to someone who just needs you know, psychiatric help. So it was my idea, along with uh, Supervisor Barger, that we put more resources into these psychiatric mobile response teams. So soon they will be operating seven days a week, 24 hours a day, because mental health challenges don't just stop at the end of the day or don't appear on the weekends. Um, that's when people have a lot of um, crises and they need help. This will also coincide with a new number. It's a nationwide number. It's going to be 988. So instead of calling 911 for somebody that you know uh, needs mental health help, uh, you can call 988 and these response teams will be activated and will begin to address the problem. And I think it's going to make a big difference, particularly for people who want to do something. They see people on their streets. They see the same person maybe, you know, sleeping on the bench. And they know that it's not just because they can't pay their rent or, or just because they got evicted. They know they have serious mental health issues, but they don't know who to call. So they call the sheriff. And to be honest with you, Hal, you know, we don't want these people arrested and put in our county jails because what happens? Pretty soon we release them, they go back on the street and they never got the help that they needed. So I think this will make a huge difference um, in really attacking that one group of people who just need a different kind of help than just a roof over their head. I have a few questions I need to get short answers. 988, when, when does that go into effect? I think that's going to go into effect in July. Yeah, yeah, July of next year. Next year, okay. That's a significant thing. Also, some of these people, I know you can uh, apply a 72-hour hold where needed, correct? Correct. Okay. But what if that's not enough? What if you need to do more? Uh, what, what can you do? Well, I think that's why these um, psychiatric mobile response teams are going to be very valuable because they will help. And um, if, uh, you know, law enforcement is involved, they will help make the initial assessment on this person to see um, if they are a danger to themselves or others, um, then they can have a hold. But more importantly, we will be able to direct them um, to get the real help that they need. And now we have more uh, mental health urgent care uh, programs in the county. So many of our hospitals actually have a mental health urgent care as opposed just to the ER. Because again, a lot of these people don't have necessarily a physical ailment that can be solved in an emergency room. They have mental health issues. And so these mental health urgent care places can also uh, keep the person calm, keep them for a while, have the mental health professionals assess them and see whether or not we can begin to get them into programs that could actually help them and set them on a, a road to recovery. In extreme cases, can you involuntarily commit, I'm sorry, can you involuntarily voluntarily commit somebody into some sort of a facility where they can get that kind of help? You know, that's complicated. Um, and I do know that that um, system exists for people, um, but it takes a lot to go through to actually um, involuntary commit 
someone um, that we just don't have enough places, to be honest with you. We don't have the kind of mental health facilities, the state run hospitals that we used to have. So there's less and less places um, to actually commit people. Um, but this system will do the assessment um, to make sure that we connect these people with the kinds of doctors and mental health professionals that they're going to need um, to possibly, um, ag again, get on a better uh, road to recovery in their own personal lives. Okay. Sounds like a significant effort going on there. Stand by, Supervisor. And coming up on Fox 11 News In Depth, a century-old injustice against a black family. Is it possible that after all these years, it's on the verge of being righted? We'll talk about that right after this. We're back with Supervisor Janice Hahn to talk about a, a remarkable project going on in Manhattan Beach. It involves a parcel of land that was once a beach resort for the black community many years ago. And what happened next sounds pretty shocking. Uh, Supervisor, tell us a little bit about what happened. Give us a little history lesson here. Well, um, in the early 1900s, there was an African-American couple, Willa and Charles Bruce, who wanted to live their American dream and purchased property in Manhattan Beach right along the waterfront. And they developed a beach resort um, that had a cafe, a, a dancing hall. They even rented bathing suits for people to enjoy a day at the beach. Now, remember, this was the time when African-Americans were not allowed to swim um, in certain beaches um, along the coast of, of California. Uh, there was only a couple of beaches here in L.A. County, another one in Santa Monica uh, named the Inkwell Beach. But this one was particularly popular with African-Americans. And anybody who's ever spent a day at the beach knows what that feels like. It's just a fun activity. Um, the fact that it was so popular uh, gave a little concern to some of the residents of then Manhattan Beach, um, who were mostly white and felt like you know, the African-Americans were sort of invading their sanctity. So they tried to run them out of town. They did everything from slash their tires to burn a mattress under the resort, uh, to put up fake no parking signs. The Ku Klux Klan was actually involved in trying to run them out of town. But Will and Charles Bruce were like, no, this is our property. We bought it fair and square. This is our little slice of the California dream and we're gonna keep it. Well, the then uh, elected officials of the city of Manhattan Beach uh, caved into the pressure to run them out of town and went through the process of eminent domain, um, actually condemning their property, taking it from them, giving them a, a pittance on the dollar for their property. Um, to which the Bruce's fought valiantly and went all the way to court, but they were ruled against, of course, everyone was against them. So fast forward a hundred years, and I realized that the two pieces of property that were the Bruce's Beach Resort were now owned by the County of Los Angeles. And in just a moment in my heart, I knew that there was only one thing to do, and that was to give the property back to the remaining descendants of the Bruce family, if they still existed. Um, it's righting a wrong, it's making restitution, it's trying to amend, to make amends uh, where, uh, you know, a family was treated terribly 100 years ago. And so we're moving through that process and actually it's going to happen. We have found uh, some remaining descendants of Willa and Charles Bruce and they're very excited about the possibility of getting back the land that was stolen from um, their grandparents 100 years ago. You know, I've known you a while. I'm hearing incredible passion out of you. You know, Hal, I, I, this was one of those things, to be honest with you, it started with a little bit of embarrassment and shame that I grew up in L.A. County and I never heard this story. I learned to swim in the beach just blocks 
uh, from this location and didn't understand it. But as you remember, I, of course, was the daughter of uh, Kenny Hahn, who was a great civil rights activist in his own time and was the only elected official that dared to meet Dr. Martin Luther King when he came for his first visit to Los Angeles. So I think it was in my DNA to try to right wrongs, to try to treat people equally and fairly. And the fact that this just literally landed in my lap, I knew what I had to do. Well, what is the family saying? I mean, they must be ecstatic. The family is so pleased and, you know, calls me an answer to their prayers. Apparently for generations, um, this family has agonized over this one piece of their own history. Uh, Till she died, Willa Bruce just kept saying, we have to get this property back. We have to get this property back. And generations of the Bruce family at family reunions, right, would talk about this. How would they ever go about getting the property back. It seemed like a lost cause, but there began to be some grassroots efforts uh, of returning this property. It was called Justice for Bruce's Beach. And that's what caught my attention. And then when I looked at the map, I said, oh my gosh, we own that property. The city of Manhattan Beach doesn't own it. The county owns it. And I knew then that I could begin to right a wrong that happened 100 years ago. What a great story. We'll, we'll look forward to when that handoff occurs. Uh, you, you got a date yet for that? No, we're going through the process. Okay. Um, but we hope, you know, we hope soon that we'll be able to transfer the, the deed of that property back to the family. How wonderful. That, that, that's really a great story. All right. We'll be back with more right after this break. Don't go away. And finally, if you haven't already, please check out my podcast. It's called What the How, and it's available wherever you get your podcast, or just go to whatthehowpodcast.com. And while we still have Supervisor Han with us, why don't you tell us about this beach video we're looking at? I know this is another passionate project of yours. Yes, Hal. So we have millions of visitors who come to our L.A. County beaches every year. But we realized when we needed to get people out of the water quickly, our evacuation system was sound based. Uh, but we realized that a lot of people who visit our beaches are hard of hearing. Um, so we had one of our county employees who has two children who are hard of hearing suggest that we develop a system that is flashing lights so that people who are in the water and need to be evacuated either because of a lightning storm or sharks or a tsunami, um, they would also be alerted to get out of the water quickly by flashing lights. They're mounted on our lifeguard stands. Um, it's a pilot program and we'll see if it works. We'll expand it to all the beaches in California. And I've just got an alert that we've got to wrap up. Thanks for joining us. Janice Hahn, Supervisor LA County. Thanks for joining us for Fox 11 News In Depth and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye, everybody.